Hi, my name is Whitney Storr. I live in Linwood, Washington. I am the mom of the most amazing um, four-year-old ever. His name is Malachi. Um, he was born um, in January of 2018. He was born at 35 weeks. Um, during my pregnancy, we got a in utero diagnosis that he would be born with spina bifida. Um, spina bifida occurs when the spinal column of uh, a fetus doesn't fully um, close. And so a child is born and their part of their spine is, is open. And so it requires um, really early interventions. It requires a surgery on the first day of life, which is what Malachi had. And then um, secondary to spina bifida, um, a lot of kids develop, a lot of babies, fetuses develop um, hydrocephalus, um, which a lot of people understand as, as water in the brain or fluid in the brain. It's, it's a buildup of fluid, um, which creates pressure, um, which can also be fatal. Um, and so that requires another surgery, a brain, a brain surgery to often place a device in the brain called a shunt to help drain that fluid. Um, he was also born with congenital heart defects. He had a couple um, holes in his heart that required open heart surgery when he was about three months old. And then he had some breathing issues. So he ended up with a tracheostomy and he is on a ventilator. Um, and so Malachi requires 24 hour care. Somebody must always be awake with him. He requires skilled nursing level care. And right now um, for the past many months, um, it has just been me and my husband taking care of him around the clock um, in 24 hour shifts while we both work full time and, um, you know, do all of the rest of the things that we do to live. Um, so that piece of caregiving is really challenging. Um, nursing is is far and few between. Um, and a lot of that um 24 hour care for my son, Malachi, and, and for a lot of kids like him falls primarily on, on the parents, which is really hard and has a lot of just significant long-term and, and impacts um, on, you know, the physical and the mental and emotional health of, of parent caregivers. Um, but Malachi is fantastic. He is just a wonder of a child. He's so resilient and he's hilarious and he knows he's hilarious. And he is just the smartest little guy. He, do, he does virtual preschool right now from our home. Um, he does his therapies um, over Zoom and he is just growing and developing and just coming into his own little personality um, as you know, this, this toddler preschool age um, as kids tend to do. And so it is, um, it is the greatest privilege of my life to be his mom. Um, I love being his parent. Um, I think though that parenting on one hand and there's caregiving on the other hand, and those are two separate things. And I think often part of the challenge of having, um, when we think about like disability supports and disability services and how we can support families of kids with disabilities and, and families of people with disabilities of all ages, we often like lump this, this um, family relationship, you know, whether it's the parent or the sibling or whatever it is with this aspect of caregiving. And for us, like, like parenting is a joy. Um, caregiving is a job. And those are two separate things. I love being a parent. Caregiving is really, really hard. And being a parent is something, it's something you choose. It's something you love. It's something you lean into and you want to do. Caregiving, our systems fail us. I think for us, we don't have access to the supports we need. Um, we are lucky Malachi is on a waiver, so he does have access to Medicaid, though that in itself is a challenge. And we have had to spend so many hours just trying to get him the um, health insurance that he needs, because I think that people overlook people that are not in this, people that are not family caregivers, 
don't understand that just because your child has a disability, just because somebody has a disability does not automatically guarantee them access to services. You don't know that until you're in the system. You think that we have this amazing, strong, uh, uh, you know, social safety net in this country, and we don't. We don't. It requires so much effort, so much time, so much investment of energy on the part of caregivers just to get the people that they care for the supports they need in their life. And, and so, you know, we don't have respite support. We don't have somebody that can come in and, and provide care for our sons so that we can go get a haircut. Um, I, I, I can't just leave the house for a quick, you know, breather. I can't go meet a friend for a quick cup of coffee. Um, our son requires two people with him at all times. He has um, severe epilepsy that happens when he has any sort of, of pain. Um, his epilepsy makes him stop breathing and he's on a ventilator. And when that happens, you have about 10 seconds to get him onto a ventilator or else um, he's gray. He <laughs> stops breathing. Um, so this isn't something that we can just say, oh, you know, there's a babysitter down the street, come in and take care of, of my child so that I can go, you know, grab lunch with my, with my husband. That can't happen. We don't get time together. We don't get time to ourselves. We don't get time to go do basic necessities. Um, it is a major ordeal just to schedule a medical appointment for ourselves. I went to my first medical appointment, my checkup for the first time in four years. Um, and my, my son Malachi and his dad were in the parking garage downstairs at the doctor's appointment just to make sure that if something happened, I would run down the stairs and help. Um, Caregiving is really hard and nobody can appreciate that until they are in the midst of it. And when you are in the midst of it, you realize that it's too late for the systems to help you. You realize that the systems had to be in place before you became a caregiver in order for them to support you and, and, and support your family because the systems aren't going to change right away. It takes time to change those systems. And then nobody understands that change that is needed because people don't talk about the hardships of caregiving. People don't talk about the fact that your physical health fails, that you feel like, like garbage all the time. <laughs> they don't talk about the impacts on mental health. They don't talk about the fact that, you know, when caregivers get together, they talk about how their mental health is failing. Um, we don't talk about our, our emotional well-being. We don't talk about how caregiving impacts all of our relationships, how we're isolated, how we end up divorced, how we end up just in every way impacted. We don't talk about how so many families have to quit their jobs because you cannot be a caregiver and a full-time working adult at the same time, even if your family needs the money in order to survive. We don't talk about any of that. Because if we talk about that, then it comes across like we're complaining about being a parent and we're not. We love being parents, but caregiving is really, really hard. What is lacking in order for my child to thrive? I, I believe it is impossible to separate the supports and services that are needed by people with disabilities from the supports and services that are needed by their caregivers. Those needs are so intertwined um, that you have to identify and develop policies that support both or else the system crumbles. Um, we need supports and services, not just for my child, but for caregivers, for our entire family. Um, I honestly would say that it is easier for my son to get services than it is for us to get the supports we need as his caregivers. Um, what needs to happen? You know, we need to pay caregivers. We need to compensate family caregivers for the job of caregiving that they are doing, not for the parenting, for the caregiving. We need to compensate caregivers for caregiving. Um, it is a job. They are doing skilled labor. They are doing. They have job responsibilities, and yet they are not paid for their job. They're they're working for free. Um, so we need to compensate families. We need to make sure that every child with a disability 
has guaranteed access to state health insurance. We need to make sure that when children with disabilities, when people with disabilities um, are determined eligible for disability services, they can actually receive those services, that we have this robust system within our state that is able to provide those services for people that are disabled. We need to make sure that our definition of disability, that is how the state defines it, is actually broad enough to encompass people that need disability services. We can't base disability services on very narrow standards and leave out everybody else that has needs um, and has a disability, but we've decided that we want to limit our disability services so that we don't have to invest what is needed to be invested in order to provide the social safety net that we really need. Um, and we need to provide supports for the, the physical and the mental and the emotional well-being of caregivers. We need to make sure that caregivers have access to mental health supports, that have access to therapists, that they have access to marriage counselors. Um, we need to make sure that they have access to respite supports so that they can go get a haircut, um, so that they can spend time with their spouse. Because I will tell you right now, if I don't have a spouse, my son is in trouble. He needs 24 hour care. I can't do that myself. No one can do that themselves. He, someone needs to be awake with him 24 hours out of the day. Um, if I don't have a two parent household or a two person household, my son and me are living in the hospital. We would have no place else to go because there's not nursing support. I don't have anybody else. Um, we need to make sure that those relationships and network of support around caregivers can remain as strong as possible um, because that's the only way that families in my situation can survive in the community. Um, we need to make sure that they have that respite support so they can go get a doctor's appointment because if something happens to me, if something happens to my husband because we're not taking care of our physical health, there is no one else to take care of my son. We are it. Um, we need to make sure that caregivers have access to, to, to programs that support their futures, that, that provide job training programs, um, employment opportunities that are based on flexible scheduling so that they can continue to support the financial well-being of their families because that financial well-being takes such a gigantic hit through caregiving. Um, often because, you know, one parent has to drop out of the labor market, usually the woman, this is very much a women's issue, very much a women's issue. Um, but also because there is so much of caregiving, so much of medical care that is, that is not covered by insurance, no matter how good your insurance is. And so you lose a job, you lose employment because somebody has to drop out of the workforce, but yet you're paying more money out because so many services are not covered by insurance. So you really end up in a financial bind too. Um, My son is the best thing that has ever happened to me. But as caregivers, having him has shown me how we as a country are failing our people. We're not taking care of our families. We're not taking care of, of people with disabilities. We're not taking care of parents. We're not taking care of women who are the primary caregivers, um, the primary family caregivers, the primary caregivers of their children with disabilities. We are not taking care of our people. And while I love being a mom, I also love the fact that being the caregiver of my son has opened my eyes to these systemic failures so that I can be here and so that I can talk about this and so that I can be involved in advocacy to create change around these issues because we need to create change. What scares me about the future is how much support my son may need and we may not be able to provide it. Um, before he was born, my husband and I struggled with infertility for years. So we were older parents when we had him. Um, and his needs were already so great so early in life that <laughs> we talk about how we quit our lives <laughs> for a while. Um, 
we were living far away from our children's hospital in Seattle and my son needed really significant um, emergency level care. And so we actually quit our jobs. We sold our house and we relocated um, to be closer to the, the hospital. Um, we found a home. It was not at all wheelchair accessible and our son is a wheelchair user. So we've been working on adapting our home to make it wheelchair accessible. And, and he's four years old. Um, you know, and, and so those are his needs right now, but obviously as he gets older, he's going to be, need more accessibility. He's going to be, need more of those, um, adaptive supports. And not only can we like talk about the, the substantial financial investment that it takes to provide for those needs, um, many of which are not are not supported and not covered by any support, any, any support system. Um, it's all out of pocket. It's all on credit cards and, and you know, bank loans. Um, but just as parents, our physical ability to provide that support for him and to, to help him, um, you know, become independent, or, you know, if he needs more support, um, how long can he live with us? How long can we support him? You know, I mean, we will always support him, but how long can we physically support him before we get too old to do that? And what happens after that? And I don't know. It's, it's one of the things that we think about and we try not to to think about honestly because we we don't really know um we don't have any other children we don't have any family that is able to provide support really if something happens to us um we have to just make sure that um we don't die <laughs> Um, that we live a really long life and that we are um, able to stay ourselves in really good health so that we can keep caregiving for many, many decades. And, um, or I guess in the alternative that, you know, as, as we get involved in advocacy, that, that things change and things improve and we create systems where, you know, kids that have disabilities and the type of medical conditions where two or three generations ago, they wouldn't have survived into adulthood um, and are now living, you know, average, totally average life expectancies, um, you know, that somehow our social system, our safety net, our medical system catches up with the fact that that is true now and begins developing the type of systems and supports that are needed for all of those children that are that are growing up with disabilities and all of the aging caregivers that are not going to be able to provide support anymore. Um, so I guess my choices are either I live forever or I get busy in advocacy and change systems to provide the type of community and the type of supports that my child will need when I'm no longer here.